Chapter Eight of the World's Lumber Room by Selina Gay. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: What Becomes of the Dust, Towns and Cities. In countries where there are no violent earthquakes or volcanoes, no tropical storms and no glaciers. Nature's labourers make and carry away their dust for the most part so quietly, and the hills look so very much the same from year to year, and even from generation to generation, that we may find some difficulty in realising that anything at all is going on. Yet we are told that by one means and another a mile in thickness has been worn away from the Mendip Hills that the part of Kent and Sussex called the Wealdon has been stripped of a mass some hundreds of square miles in extent and several hundred yards in thickness, and that the district to the south of Snowdon has lost from its surface a mass of 20,000 feet, a whole mountain, in fact, as lofty as the Andes. Not an atom of all these many million tons of rock has been lost, however, though it may have changed its appearance so much as to be often hardly recognisable. And it is when we consider what has become of it that we may perhaps gain the best idea of what nature's wear and tear really means. For, quote, the entire mass of stratified deposits is the measure of former denudation, end quote. In England, roughly speaking, all the rocks, with the exception of the granite hills of Cornwall, Devon and Worcestershire, are stratified, i.e. have been deposited in beds or strata at the bottom of seas or lakes or at the mouths of rivers. All have had a previous existence in some other shape and have been worn away from some unknown land which we may dream of as Atlantis, if we will. Rivers are the great carriers, and if the refuse conveyed by them has had a long journey, the visible part of it reaches the sea in the form chiefly of mud and sand, which are both usually deposited within one or two hundred miles from the shore, though the finest portion may be carried farther, especially where the current is strong, and if it becomes entangled in ice is, of course, carried much farther still. Footnote the beach pebbles are, for the most part, made by the action of the waves on the coast, and though often swept along it, are seldom carried out to sea. End of footnote. Much of the sand remains close in shore, forming shoals and sandbanks, and much is thrown up on the beach, where it is dried by the wind, and then, unless there are cliffs or rising ground to stop it, is frequently blown inland again, and piled up into sandhills, which drift farther and farther year by year, swallowing up houses, villages, and even forests. This is what the sand has done on the flat coasts of Jutland and the Bay of Biscay. The Lande, as the sand dunes are called in France, extend from the Garonne to the Pyrenees, and moving forward at the rate of sixty or seventy feet every year, have buried several villages which were well known in the Middle Ages. In some places their progress is arrested by quite small running streams, the sand, as it drifts into the water, being carried back into the sea. But, on the other hand, they have proved more than a match for the river Adour, which they have turned nearly a mile and a quarter out of its original course. In the Outer Hebrides, the encroachment of the sands has been checked by planting them with the sea reed, or mat grass, whose tough roots are often twenty feet long and serve to bind the sand together. In Ceylon, where the rivers flow rapidly down from lofty hills, they reach the coast heavily laden with sand and mud, which, instead of being carried any distance out to sea, are heaped in bars along the shore by the currents of the Bay of Bengal. The bars extend north and south, and at length attain such dimensions that the rivers, being unable to force their way through, are obliged to flow behind them in search of a fresh outlet. Footnote. These barriers grow especially fast on the east of the island, to which large quantities of sand are brought by the southern current from the Coromandel coast. End of footnote. 
long embankments from a mile to three miles broad and forty miles long have thus gradually accumulated and having first been in some degree consolidated by the growth of an ipomere or convolvulus which sends out roots from every joint the soil has then been fertilized by glassworts saltworts and other sand-loving plants until at last it has become capable of supporting plantations of coconut trees many of the river sands of ceylon consist of fragments of rubies sapphires and garnets intermixed with others of quartz and mica and the bed of the manic ganga in particular is composed to such a large extent of ruby sand that it reminds one of the story of sinbad but as none of these precious fragments is larger than a mustard seed the sand is valueless except for polishing and for sawing ivory among the great accumulations of sand existing at the present day must be mentioned those of the desert of gobi lying north of the himalayas concerning whose buried cities and marvellous hidden treasures many tales are told one of these cities named pirna is said by the chinese to have been suddenly overwhelmed in the sixth century and an interesting account exists of the flight from another called katar or kank of a mahometan priest who for many successive fridays had warned his flock of the calamity about to fall upon the city in this desolate region the wells are all protected by huts else they would soon be choked by the ever-shifting sand which stretches away in the distance like a great sea marked by regular waves which rise one behind the other in rows to the height of ten twenty or even one hundred feet leaving the hard underlying clay exposed to view between them the advance of the sand takes place chiefly in the spring when the wind blows constantly from the north but even then it is often so gradual that people will go on occupying a tenement whose court may be filled with sand up to the veranda from the breaking of the sand dune over the wall but though destructive from one point of view nothing on the other hand is better fitted than sand for the preservation of ancient monuments and should any of the buried cities of gobi ever be uncovered no doubt they will be found to have been taken excellent care of so at least it has been in the western plain of the nile where the sand is so fine as to be like a fluid and has buried and preserved the monuments of ipsambul so perfectly that not a feature is injured nor are even the colours impaired the uses to which we put sand are many and various but so familiar that the mere enumeration of them will suffice the farmer and gardener use it for mixing with heavy clay soils which would else be too stiff and air-tight for any crops to flourish in the stone and marble cutter want it for sawing grinding and polishing for which last two purposes it is also used in many other trades and the housewife scours her pots and pans with it either in the natural state or in the form of sandpaper all this is obvious enough and no one will doubt that sand is useful but who unless he knew the fact would guess that sand could also be made ornamental yet the inscription on an old german drinking-glass runs as follows i am beautifully clear and bright and i am made of sand and ashes very unpromising looking dust this yet out of it come the crystal glass which sparkles on the dinner table and the window glass by which light is admitted to our rooms as well as innumerable other varieties how and when the art of glass making was invented is unknown but it was practised by the ancient assyrians and egyptians as the specimens found in the palace of nimrud among the relics of babylon and the tombs of egypt amply testify the discovery may well have been made by accident since lumps of impure glass are sometimes found among the ashes when a rick of straw has been burnt down for straw contains as has been said a good deal of silica and as it also contains potash the melting of the two together produces glass 
many minute particles of glass are found in granite, formed in a similar way by the union of silica with the potash or soda contained in the felspar. Footnote. Though the variety of felspar called orthoclase contains so much potash as to be known as potash felspar, no cheap and easy way has been found of extracting the potash, which is therefore prepared from the ashes of plants. Soda felspar is called albite. End of footnote. Most silicious sands, for it is of these only that we are now speaking, are more or less yellow from the iron they contain, and it is this which gives the green tinge to common glass. The finest and whitest sand ever seen was some brought from America and exhibited in the Crystal Palace in 1851, which was perfectly pure quartz and as white as snow. But sand such as this is not easily obtained, and though millions of tons are scattered throughout the British Isles, it is rarely found free from colouring matter and other impurities, and needs washing and burning before it can be used. The chief places from which glass-making sand is obtained in England are Alum Bay, Lynn, Aylesbury, Wareham, Reigate and the New Forest, and large quantities are also brought from Fontainebleau in France, as well as from America, Australia and New Zealand. But wherever it may come from, and whatever may be its destiny, its past history has been much the same in all cases. Falling, in the first instance, from banks, cliffs, or mountainsides, it has undergone much grinding and pounding in the bed either of glacier or river, and after being washed, carefully sorted, and carried no one knows how many miles, has at last reached the resting place from which, after the lapse it may be of ages, it has been taken to the glasshouse, whence it emerges in a totally changed form to begin a fresh career. For, from the common wine bottle, made of rough sand and other coarse materials, on through the many other varieties, till we come to the finest plate, crystal, and Venetian glass, from the common ill-shaped tumbler, to the exquisite ornaments fabricated by Salviati, every kind owes its existence, more or less, to the sand whose history we have been tracing. But sand does not always remain sand until man happens to find a use for it. At the mouth of many rivers it is frequently found cemented into stone by the carbonate of lime brought down by them, and all the sandstone used for building was once nothing but loose sand lying along the shore, every grain of which has been more or less rounded by long-continued washing. Some beds of sandstone are a thousand feet thick and more, and were, to all appearance, accumulated in bygone ages on an ancient shore which stretched from England across the north of Germany. It is not easy to say how the sand was consolidated, whether by pressure only or by pressure and heat combined. Still less can we tell whence came the iron oxide which coats each separate grain of the red sandstone. Sandstones consist mainly of grains of silica, which are generally intermixed with small particles of other minerals, and are cemented either by carbonate of lime, iron or silica. Where both grains and cement are of silica, the sandstone would seem to have been formed by the agency of heat. Intensely hot steam, for instance, may have penetrated the mass of porous sand, partly melting each grain which, as it cooled, would be cemented to its neighbours. The heat of molten lava would also have a similar effect, for the sand used to line furnaces is found at the end of a fortnight to be in part converted into a compact, close-grained stone simply by the heat, and quartz rock, in which the grains can hardly be distinguished even with the aid of a microscope, was probably also formed by heat. Pure quartz consists simply of silica and crystallises in six-sided prisms. Cornish, Bristol and other so-called diamonds are small bright colourless crystals of quartz, the purest variety of which is the rock crystal used by spectacle makers, while the Scotch cangorm, purple amethyst, 
chrysoprase, chalcedony, carnelian, onyx, heliotrope, or bloodstone, and the precious opal, all consist of silica, variously coloured by other minerals and metals. We cannot indeed say that any of these stones have ever actually existed in the form of sand, but neither does there seem to be any reason why sand should not, in process of time, be transformed into any one of them. But to return to the changes which we can see for ourselves to have taken place. At the Cape of Good Hope there is a sandstone formation some two thousand feet thick, which has evidently been affected in different degrees by heat, for in some parts it is stained red, brown, or yellow by iron, in others it is perfectly white, as the red sand in a furnace becomes, and in others it is as compact as quartz. There are in Great Britain some thirty well-known sandstone quarries of different qualities and colours, which supply large quantities of stone. Of ancient sandstone buildings in this country there are the abbeys of Tinton, Whitby, Revo, the cathedrals of Ripon and Durham, and churches in Newcastle, Derby, Shrewsbury, Ludlow, and other places too numerous to specify. All these, and many others, some of them several hundred years old, are built of that which once was merely sand on the seashore, and as not a few of them have in great part crumbled away, and are still crumbling, much of the stone will, probably in time, return to the seashore again. So much for the sand and now for the mud, which, though carried farther out to sea before it is deposited, is seldom dropped more than two hundred miles from the coast. In a tideless sea or gulf it is deposited close in shore, or even at the mouth of the river, as witness the Nile Delta and the mud flats on the coast of Nova Scotia, which are derived from the neighbouring cliffs of shale and sandstone the sediment being deposited tide after tide in layers, some of them as much as one-tenth of an inch thick, but generally much thinner. The wide plains and low plateaus of western Russia have evidently been similarly formed of mud and sand. But as we travel eastward and approach the volcanic rocks of the Ural Mountains, both are altered by the heat and pass into schists and quartzites. The muddy Russian plains are, so geologists say, composed of some of the most ancient beds of sediment in the world, and having been raised above the waves ages ago, have never since been brought within their reach, or suffered much change of level. In age they correspond with some of the Welsh rocks, but in Wales the mud has been hardened and altered into slate, while in Russia it remains pretty much in its pristine condition. One of the most ancient heaps of mud in England is now dignified by the name of the Long Mind or Long Mount, which is ten miles long, and even now, though it has lost much of its height, rises more than 1,000 feet above Church Stratton, and is not less than 26,000 feet thick. Many of the Long Mind rocks consist of innumerable thin layers, some of them scarcely thicker than a sheet of paper, and evidently once thin films of very fine mud and sand, though now hardened into shales and slates of various tints from deep purple to grey and olive. A gigantic mud heap this is certainly, and more ancient than we can easily realise, even though we know that the whole of England to the east of it, with its thousands of feet of sandstones, coal beds, limestones, chalk downs, etc., has been formed since it was deposited. The long mend rocks were originally deposited under water in horizontal layers or films, such as those of the Nova Scotia mud flats. The dark, gritty, coarse part of the mud brought by each tide sinking first, and the finest forming the top of each layer. But whatever other changes may have taken place since those days, one is very evident. The great mass of mud has been upheaved until it stands almost on end, and consequently, though it is quite plain that the layers were once in a horizontal position, they are now, some of them, almost vertical. They split off very readily along the lines of bedding, as one would expect them to do, 
for each layer of mud would naturally be slightly hardened before the succeeding one was deposited. But the fact of the rock thus splitting shows that, though of the same age and composition as some of the best roofing slates in the world, it is, after all, not true slate, but shale, for true slate splits not along the lines of bedding, but at some angle, often at right angles to them, and has clearly undergone some change which the shale has escaped. Any fossils such as shells which occur in shales are found lying unaltered in shape, with their flat sides parallel to the bedding, just as they would naturally have dropped through the water. When they occur in slate, on the other hand, they are distorted and stand almost or quite on end, as they would do if the mud enclosing them had been subjected to great pressure from the sides. A mass of clayey mud containing grains of sand, mica, etc., when sufficiently pressed as to be reduced to half its original bulk, will be found capable of splitting into almost any number of thin layers at right angles to the direction in which the pressure is applied. It has, in fact, acquired the slaty cleavage, and the various grains composing it have ranged themselves with their flat sides facing the direction from which the pressure came. White wax and even ice may be made to acquire this cleavage in the same way by pressure, and it is also developed to a certain extent in biscuit by the mere application of the rolling pin. All mud which has been converted into true slate has, therefore, we conclude, been subjected to enormous pressure, and has thence acquired the property of easily splitting into thin plates, which makes it so valuable as a roofing material. Fine mud is often rolled into roundish lumps and embedded in the coarser materials, and it is to these that are due the greasy whitish-green spots often seen in slates, the grain being too fine to bite the pencil. The sediment carried by the Rhine into the German Ocean consists chiefly of silica, alumina and iron, and is just such as might hereafter form a clay slate, rich in iron. The slate quarries of Carnarvonshire are the largest in the world, and give employment to 3,000 men, the whole number employed in slate quarrying throughout Great Britain being about 15,000. The green slates of Cumberland are composed of volcanic dust and ashes, which often contain large quantities of felspar, and thus form a very tenacious mud. Volcanic dust, converted into mud, has been found, more or less, wherever the bed of the ocean has been explored, Vast quantities, as we have seen, are ejected during eruptions, and the lighter part is carried hither and thither by the wind. Dust from Mount Hecla has at times been conveyed to Denmark, and since much larger quantities have no doubt been dropped by the way, there are probably large accumulations in the German as well as in the Indian Ocean, which may be converted into shales or slates according to circumstances. Ancient mud is found, however, in various other conditions besides, some as soft clay, some mixed with lime when it becomes marl, some as hard clay, and some so altered by heat as to be crystalline and much harder than even the hardest and oldest of the Welsh slates. Many of the most valuable clays occur in a semi-hardened state and are blasted in rock-like masses but whether hard or soft and sticky, all clays are essentially hydrous, i.e. watery, silicates of alumina, and though always containing other minerals, are chiefly compounds of silicon oxide, silica, with alumina, the oxide of the silvery-looking metal called aluminium. Neither silicon, which is a black crystalline substance, nor aluminium occur in the free state in nature. Clays owe their peculiar plasticity to the presence of combined water. Footnote. Oxygen constitutes nearly half the weight of the earth, and is found combined with many metals and minerals. Soda, alumina and lime are all compounds of oxygen with the metals sodium, aluminium and calcium, 
none of which occur in nature except in union with oxygen. End of footnote. The purest form in which silica is found is quartz, but even that contains a trace of alumina and sometimes of iron as well. And the purest form of alumina is the blue sapphire, which is crystallized alumina coloured by iron and containing also a minute quantity of silica. Neither silica nor alumina, therefore, is ever absolutely pure. These two, with potash or soda, constitute the felspar, which makes up so large a portion not only of the granites, but of all the lavas, ancient and modern. And decayed felspar is simply clay, which varies in colour and consistency as it contains more or less silica and more or less iron. The purest clays, those used for the manufacture of porcelain, are more than half silica, and none are entirely free from iron, while many contain soda, potash, magnesia, etc. The brick-making clays, when burnt, come out red, blue or black when they contain much iron, brown when they contain magnesia, white and dun-coloured when they contain lime. More than a thousand million common bricks are made in England every year. But nature too has her potteries and brick kilns, where she bakes her clay to bring out its colours, and one of the largest of these is in the bad lands of the little Missouri, which are bad indeed for travellers, since the whole country is one huge labyrinth of ruins, which at times look like those of some gigantic city. Here are fragments of apparently cyclopean masonry, walls, pinnacles, ramparts, terraces, obelisks, pyramids, fortifications, all heaped together in the wildest confusion and baked of various colours from deep red and brown to pale yellow or china white. Here and there are towers and spires, looking as if they had just been freshly painted with vermilion and reminding one of the churches of North Germany. And here again are piles of what look like crumbled bricks and mountains of potsherds, such as that of Monte Testaccio near Rome, said to be composed of the broken pottery thrown away by the Romans. Almost all the porcelain clays are derived from the felspar of granite rocks, and usually contain spangles of mica. The soda or potash, having been attacked by the carbonic acid of air or water, is readily dissolved and washed away. Then the silicate of alumina which remains is more slowly carried down the hillside in the form of fine powder, some of which is deposited in beds along the watercourses, while the finest and purest is carried into the valleys or into rivers and lakes. The farther it is carried, the more perfectly it is sorted, and hence the low valley clays are often wonderfully fine. The soil at the bottom of granite hills is therefore usually too stiff, while that on the top is too sandy to be fertile. The granite hills of Cornwall and Devonshire supply all the kaolin, or china clay, used in the Staffordshire potteries. This is the finest and purest white clay known, and derives its name from Kaoling, Lofty Ridge, the mountain from which it is obtained by the Chinese, who seem to have been the first to turn it to account. The place whence the largest quantity is derived in England is the neighbourhood of St. Austell, Cornwall, and when first raised it has the appearance and consistency of mortar. China stone, also used for making porcelain, is a product of the same granite rocks, being simply felspar in a less advanced state of decay, and at Belique for manor, kaolin is obtained from the undecomposed red granite of the district, which becomes white when calcined, the iron being extracted by magnets. The Chinese began the manufacture of porcelain some two thousand or more years ago, and at the present day have large manufactories, King Ti Chin alone boasting, it is said, nearly three thousand kilns. Chinese porcelain was first introduced into Europe in the sixteenth century, but no real progress was made in imitating it until the eighteenth century, when Bircher of Dresden made first a red ware and then white porcelain. 
earthenware of a coarse kind was manufactured in staffordshire from a very early period in one of the ranges of the appalachian mountains known as blue ridge the rocks which are principally gneiss are decomposed to a depth of fifty feet or more and converted into a reddish greasy brick clay for gneiss is composed of the same three minerals as granite but these are arranged in plates instead of grains and in the blue ridge rocks the plates of quartz may be seen in their original positions embedded in clay in some of these rocks the various stages of decomposition may be well observed thus the upper part is completely kaolinized and almost entirely freed from the iron which gives the red tint to the coarser clay lower down the rock is partly decomposed and lower still quite unchanged so that it seems evidently to have been decayed from without probably by water charged with carbonic acid filtering through from the surface the iron oxide seems then to have been dissolved out and carried away to the foot of the range where there are immense deposits of iron ore footnote the gneiss and granite rocks of brazil are similarly decomposed to the depth of a hundred feet End of footnote. west of blue ridge alumina is found in considerable quantities combined with a small amount of iron and silica but instead of being in the soft sticky state of clay it is intensely hard being in fact crystallized were it not that the crystals are all flawed and therefore valueless as gems they might almost be called a mass of sapphires and rubies for many of them are colored with the most beautiful tints of pink blue and deep ruby as it is the mineral is called corundum and is most useful for grinding and polishing and being much harder than emery and prepared at much less cost is likely to be a formidable rival emery itself is but another form of alumina containing a large admixture of iron and is obtained chiefly from the decayed rocks at cape emery in the island of naxos footnote the hardness of the sapphire being one hundred that of corundum is seventy seven and the emery of naxos forty six by melting china clay with red lead the silica is extracted and after exposure for several weeks to intense heat the mixture on being allowed to cool is found separated into two layers the upper mainly silicate of lead and glassy looking the lower crystalline and containing perfect but colourless crystals of alumina which are specimens of the corundum and when coloured by the addition of iron cobalt etc differ in no respect in composition or appearance from the oriental ruby and sapphire End of footnote. the opaque stone known as the oriental turquoise is a phosphate of alumina coloured by copper and thus from clay and mud we have come round to precious stones again whether the latter have actually been formed out of the decomposed materials of older rocks or no there is apparently no reason in the nature of things why they should not have been for in the blue ridge rocks we seem to have almost the whole process before us there is the gneiss the decayed felspar greasy brick clay kaolin and finally the corundum which seems to have needed only slightly different treatment in the great laboratory to convert it into precious stones footnote the old naturalists said heat was required to ripen precious stones certainly they are found only in the south though the common topaz is found by the hundredweight at falun and crystals of common emerald several feet long occur in the felspar quarries of finland End of footnote. however this may be we have traced our sand and mud far enough for the present purpose and have seen how nature has sorted and transformed them into sandstones clays shales slates etc and how man has taken them up where she left them and has used them from the earliest ages to pile up those vast heaps of stone brick glass tiles and slates which we call towns and cities what was the tower of babel but baked mud and what is the modern babylon in the main but a vast transformed mud heap rivalling the longmind in size 
though certainly not in beauty. End of chapter 8